good afternoon, uh, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Sebastian, Sebastian Engie, and I'm the National Sales Manager at Fronius. Thanks again for everyone for joining uh, our training session or our webinar today. So basically, this is part five out of six. Don't worry if you haven't watched the first few ones. It is or it will be available on uh, YouTube also if you want to go to go back um, and have a watch. So. Today, what we have planned for you guys is to talk about uh, reliability. Of course, we spoke a bit about reliability last week, but today it's gonna be a bit uh, different, uh, I would say, right? So before I go into the, the topic of what we have ready uh, today for you guys, let's do a quick summary of what we uh, discussed last week, right? And when we discussed last week, it was a lot about how we manufacture our product and few key topics as, a, as an example. So one of the highlights of, let's say, the topic uh, in the last uh, webinar that we did was active cooling. And we explained how active cooling was important. We also had few installers coming online e explaining why they think it is beneficial in their daily activities and that they've seen also on site how important it is. So that's why for us, for example, at Fronius, we work really hard in this new heat sink technology, which is on our Gen 24. So this is basically the whole uh, front of the inverter. And you can see it is a bit different. The heat sink is not at the back now, it's actually at the front. And you can see that the fan is basically sucking, sucking the air from the front and blowing it on, on the side, right? So it's a bit of a different cooling concept and a more uh, efficient cooling concept. Just to give you an example, we don't need to run the fan as hard as it, as it, uh, it is physically designed for, right? Why we don't need to run it uh, as, as fast uh, as, and as hard as uh, it is physically designed, it's because of the whole cooling uh, heat sink also. So as you can see there, uh, the different heat map and different heat uh, spot uh, on, the, on the product itself. Then also we, we explain our, uh, about our uh, testing procedures. Of course, you have what the standard has asked. Uh, we also have lab testing, right? But we always try to push the limit. So here you can see how we take this big uh, kind of fire, uh, fire hose there when we splash the whole inverter to make sure that it, it is, uh, it maintains its IP rating. And as, as an example, I won't recommend you guys to, to try this, of course, uh, but definitely we test our unit uh, to make sure that it withstands the IP rating. And of course, there's uh, also the water jets that we do with our uh, product, which is quite, I would say an interesting part where we check the IP rating again of this is our new Gen24 in our lab. Um, every time people think that it's just for marketing purposes, but when you come to Fronius International, you always see uh, those different labs in action uh, as, a, as an example. And of course, we explain how having um, a subsidiary here in Australia close to our installers is an important part, right? So being uh, in Australia now for uh, a bit more than 10 years, uh, it's quite a big achievement, right? Having a subsidiary, is there, a subsidiary there. And of course, having people working, being here and being reliable if you guys need uh, assistance uh, as an example. So you can see that was, uh, I would say, the main topic of, um, of what we discussed last time. And of course, we went a bit more in details, but we actually spoke about the reliability of the product and how it is important uh, to have everything uh, designed within the product and also tested, not only in the lab, but also being tested out there in, uh, in the field, right? So of course, reliability has a lot of different factors. Right, and there is one thing which I think reliability is quite uh, interlinked with is in terms of sustainability. Right, when you talk, when you think about reliability in uh, general, if you don't have a sustainable process, as a, as an example, your whole solution is not, let's say, reliable. So just to give you an example, if you need to produce an inverter, uh, as an example, if it costs you more energy to make them uh, than actually selling the inverter, for example, you're not making enough money out of the product, it's not as a reliable solution, 
Um, if you take another uh, example, if your product is failing uh, all the time, or if there's always problem, then there's, a, there's, there's an issue in terms of design of the product, which makes it more, not, not reliable, right? So one thing which we link reliability with is the sustainability, right? Having a sustainable process to make sure that the product, of course, is designed in its most optimal way, but also that you have um, the product in in the final design where if something happened, there's always, let's say, backup uh, option there, right? And when it comes to sustainability, we always ask uh, installers, when we talk about sus sustainability, what comes to, to mind? So maybe I will get some of you guys who wants to participate, just raise your, your hand there. All right, there's Susan who, who raised her hand. So maybe I will... Unmute you there, Suzanne. Uh, yes, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Yep. Can you hear? Hi, Suzanne. I think yes, you were you were. Did that work? If I'm, yes, that that works. I think you joined us last time. Also, correct me if I'm wrong. There. Your I name is. I tried to join you last time. I had I had terrible internet connection. I had to drop out. Uh, that's why the name I see is is quite uh, quite familiar. So, where are you from, uh, Susan? Which part of Australia are you from? We're in Ballarat, in Victoria. Ballarat, Victoria, not too far from from our office uh, there in Melbourne, around two no. two hours. And from which Bring company are you time. from? Bailey Technologies. Bailey Bailey Technologies. So. Uh, Suzanne, when we talk about sustainab sustainability, right, what comes to, to your mind? Um, with solar in particular? In general, solar, or in, when we just say sustainability, what, what comes to mind? Um, with solar in particular, it is a... There's a lot of systems out there that are not going to last beyond the five, six-year mark. They're going to be... They're, they're thrown up there. They're the cheapest stuff that, you know, the cheapest products that can be dredged up from anywhere. They've been installed without any care. They're going mm -hmm. to need to be pulled off. Within five to 10 years, they're going to need to be pulled off. They're not going to be doing their job. The inverters are not going to be working. Most of them are put next to the switchboard, wherever that happens to be. If that's north facing in full sun, then they are. Um, we need to have properly designed solar, properly installed, and a product like Fronius where we can take our little kit, take our boards down and just change them out when needed is, it's a, it's a big selling point actually. We use it a lot for, for customers. Um, these products are not easily recycled. They're not easily dealt with. They just go into landfill. So we need to get them we need to get it done right so that people who believe that they're buying this that they're purchasing solar because they want to contribute they want to be sustainable we want to make sure they actually are mm -hmm. uh, so so from what i'm getting from you there right so you're saying that we're putting all this solar out there right that you're, they're not going to last for a long time so we're trying to fix something out there which may cause another issue with the recycling side of things, right? Correct me if I'm if, if I'm wrong there. Yes, it's, excuse me a second, sorry. It's, it's all right, it's all right. All right, I think um, we'll maybe go back to to, uh, to the session, but thanks so much, Suzanne, for, for the part that you shared with us here, right? So, um, I think you covered quite quite a long a, a lot of, of information there, and definitely there will be some some freebies on on your way. We have your your contact details also there. So sustain, sustainability um, in terms of reliability, also as as mentioned, it kind of work uh, hand to hand in hand in, in a way, right? And one thing that uh, Susan mentioned is when those products, for example, ends up in landfill right what happens and we always show this picture because of course having um installing solar we want to make things uh, of course from a renewable side of things making clean energy but what happened to those products right at the end of the, the life because i can tell you every electronics will fail at a certain stage the question is what happened next right and when we show uh those those pictures 
it's always interesting because there's the one side of, of course, when you have a brand new install, uh, you're having solar, of course, you're doing, you're doing uh, something for, for the environment, you're doing also something for your bills, don't get me wrong, that's also one of the biggest reasons. But doing something for the environment is also becoming a topic more discussed uh, out there. And when we look at inverters, we are like, okay, where does, does those inverters end? It's not only that, where does the panels end also? Are we trying actually to fix uh, the problem there, which is basically where, how we produce energy, how do we produce clean energy? But the, as you can see by this picture, by creating cr clean energy with those products, we're creating another problem, which is basically panels, inverters ending in landfill. Right, so we always need to see, okay, are we actually doing the right thing? And for the installers who are joining us today, of course, there is a demand out there, right? So if we need to take uh, a, a step, uh, a step back, there is always this customer needs of, okay, they want to go clean. They can go, they want to go clean in terms of maybe for the marketing, right, to promote their company, saying, hey, you know, our building are hundred percent carbon neutral, for example, or they do it for the dollar value, which is, I would say, quite a high percentage out there. They want to install solar on the roof to make sure that, okay, in terms of bills, it's not high. And of course, you have customers out there that are just interested, right? Uh, I know that there's a lot of engineers who are really interested how the product is made. Uh, and of course, that's a, a big, a big uh, customer needs also there, right? And filling those customer needs when it comes to sustainability, uh, you need to ask yourself, okay, we have those targets, there's those companies out there who wants to get this information, how sustainable solar is, right? How do we provide those customers with, uh, with, with the right information, right? So what do you actually do when it comes to finding the right information? Because of course you can install panels on the roof, you can install inverters, but how clean uh, actually those, those panels and those inverters are made from clean energy, for, for example. So that's a, that's a, a question. I know that uh, maybe some of you guys are, are a bit, a bit uh, shy here with, with the group that we have today, but any, any one of you who wants to type there, if you need to find this information, right? How clean in terms of renewable energy is used to make products, what do you guys do? If you're an installer joining us today, maybe if you can just type in the in the question section or even the chat section, I will let you guys choose. What do you guys do if you need to find this information? Do you go on Google? What what are your what are your steps? Okay, someone someone is someone uh, someone was quite straightforward. They said, "Hey, I go on Google." AD also is saying that they Google or they contact the manufacturer, right? Google is out there, isn't it? Um, it's it's always it's always always the, the way, right? Um, look at the carbon footprint. I think Dylan, has, uh, Dylan Pereira has a good point there. Look for the carbon footprint. Maybe for Dylan, a quick question. How do you actually um, get to know the carbon footprint of the product? All right, some of the other people are saying, okay, you can Google. Uh, oh, there's a lot of parts, points uh, which comes with, with uh, Google here which is quite uh, interesting, uh, I would say, right? So let's look at some of the common answers that we, we got. Of course, maybe I should edit a bit the, the slide there, put Google uh, first, but a lot of things uh, that we see is, of course, you guys will uh, come and ask the manufacturer, right? Which is, let's say us. And then from there, you ask the manufacturer, we come and we tell you, um, the answer, you say, okay, this is the emission. We give you the, the information. You pass this information to the end user or the business owner and happy days, the job is done, right? The question that I would have is, are we actually having the right info out there, right? I'm not sure how many of you have seen those two documentaries uh, from, from uh, Netflix, but I think they are pretty, uh, interesting. Um, I haven't watched, uh, apologies, I haven't watched the one on the right, the planet of the humans, but watched the social dilemma, which is a very interesting uh, part, which all talks about um, how this information gets, gets to you, right? Sometimes you can have this concept of the whole, just to give you uh, an example, which, which they, they discuss um, 
in in there where for example if you get some information you will be biased towards let's say thinking that uh, just to give to give a, an, a, an example there but for example the earth is flat for example right it's if you're always googling the same thing of course you will get uh, some of the condensing information what i would highly recommend is to look at those information and see if they they are, are true or not because you can go on google and someone said this before you're not 100 percent sure right you always need to check when to double check right is there any reference out there and that's where i think it's very interesting uh, when you look at the right information right because when we talk about uh, let's say the renewable sector right when we talk about renewable in general i always like to 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 show this picture on the right because we know that one of the highest co2 emission comes from transportation right and that's why people are changing from electric vehicle but if your electric vehicle is kind of charging from the dirty coal power are you actually clean right of course if you're with your with where you're charging your car is actually a green source of energy then that's fine but if it is not, that's what we call basically greenwashing, right? And what is, is interesting, I think in Australia, I, I was reading an article the other day where they were saying how um, HCC will start to to look into those all those companies saying that they are actually green, but they are actually not 100% uh, there, right? So it's always good to get this this whole picture because again, if we go back to the first picture that I showed you guys with all those inverters being done, all those panels being done, we as an industry, we are saying we are making a change, a climate change in, in a way, right? We are pushing for more renewable because it's better for the environment. But you can see that there's another kind of challenge which is coming, which is basically what do we do with the system that failed, right? What, the, what recycle procedures do we have in Australia? So that's why it's always good to have this reality check in a perfect, let's say, uh, world. Of course, if you look at the success, just put a lot of solar out there, just install solar everywhere and the problem will be fixed. But you can see there's more challenges than that. There is the recycling part, there's the quality of the product, there's the reliability of the product. There's a lot of different things that need to be checked as an example. The other part is you never know if there will be standard coming into place. So just to give you an example, where in Europe it's a they are a bit more advanced in terms of targets. So they are aiming to be, for example, carbon neutral, where there is the European Green Deal. There's also in terms of um, supply chain, in terms of if your product is cleaner, as an example, right? Then they won't really look into the amount of, um, let's say the, the product that you're moving from one place to the other one in terms of CO2 emission and scrutiny to see what you're doing, it will be less, let's say, uh, they will look into it less uh, in a way, right? So you can see around the world, there's different things happening and you never know here also in Australia, what rules can come in, into play as an example. You never know there can be a carbon tax coming into play depending on how your products are manufactured, which can be also a big topic in terms of, because we know how price also is important uh, for, for customers, right? So that's why it's always important to look at this, the, the CO2 emission of those products and how sustainable the product is. And you're asking yourself, what are we doing at Froyance, right? At the very um, early stage, we were discussing how, in terms of innovation, what we like to, to work on, right? Because at the early stage, um, if you remember, whoever, who, or all, the, all of you guys who came to our first uh, few webinars, we, we spoke about, about our history, about how Fronia started, right? And it basically started with battery charging. And why did we start uh, the battery charging division is because people were throwing out, throwing away uh, the batteries, right? Because they were deeply discharged, right? Because people were not driving their car during the week uh, as, a, as an example back then. So sustainability has always been in a core uh, value of, of our business, right? And that's why, for example, with our Gen24, we actually put a project team together to look at the life cycle analysis 
of our product because we wanted to know what is the impact that the Gen24 would have uh, out there. So just to give you a, a life cycle analysis scenario, so you have a Simo Gen24 plus 10, and we are putting an expecting, expected lifetime of 20 years in Australia, and then we are recycling without dismantling. What does this mean is we don't remove every single component, we're just pretty pulling apart all the big part uh, as, a, as an example. And if you look at the contribution to their carbon footprint, you can see that the inverter has a 6.4%, so it's pretty a small, a small percentage. But when you look at the PV cell, it basically has the biggest contribution to the carbon footprint there, right? Now you need to look at the inverter itself, this 6.4%, right? Okay, it's, it's a, it can be a, a small percentage, but it is a percentage that you can save in terms of carbon footprint. So let's have a, a closer look in terms of how do we get to a very low percentage there. The first thing is when it comes to manufacturing, so all the production, the assembly of the, uh, of the product, 81% comes from uh, renewable energy. Right, so all our heating, cooling of our building, all the electrical component, every basically all of this, eighty-one percent comes into uh, comes from renewable energy. All the packaging and components there, basically ninety percent is recyclable. Maybe we'll give also a, a freebie. Um, Away here, you can see this heat sink. It's made of um, of recycled aluminium. Can anyone guess here? Right. I will give it to the first few one who are closer. Right to the answer. How many can of beers do you think needs to be recycled to make one of those heat sink? And I will give you some tips. Right. When well, I need to meet, make it fair for for everyone. It's a three digit number and it's below five hundred. And it's more than 100 cans of beers needs to be re recycled. All right, so let's see. So it's below it's below 500, and it's more than 100. We're getting some close numbers there. I'm seeing a lot of numbers. It's as if I'm, I'm at the, the stock market right, right now. All right, we got one who is very close, who is basically Barry Allen. You can, you can pretty close. He had 350 cans, so it's actually 323 cans, if I'm not wrong there, if I remember that uh, uh, correctly, right? So you're pretty close. So we'll definitely send you uh, some uh, freebies also, also there. But thanks again for, for you guys for participating uh, in, in this session. The other part that we had to make sure is the transportation. So in terms of transportation, as you know, all our product is made um, at Fronius International in Europe, in Australia, right? And of course, if we had to fly all those products in, it will cost, it will basically have a bigger toll in terms of CO2 emissions. So of course, we always try to use sea transport for Australia. And of course, in, in Europe, we try to use land transport as, as much as we can. And by doing so, we are able to have a 27% reduction in terms of CO2 emission. Also, as mentioned, quality is very important uh, for us. So we don't want people to change product every year, as an example. So that's why in terms of quality, in terms of production, in terms of reliability, we want to make sure it is at its highest as possible there, right? So if we look at the comparison, because we need to have a, 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 a bit of a look of Okay, this savings, this CO2 saving, what does it represent? Of course, you will induce some CO2 with the Gen24, right? Because to make them, we have, uh, we are emitting a bit of CO2. In terms of emission, it's around 38 gram of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, right? 
When you compare that to your grid usage, so if you're using power from the grid, you're basically emitting around 600 to 100 gram, one, sorry, 1,000 gram of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, right? So this is if you're using power from the grid, that's how much you basically induce there, right? Now, if you look at the whole system benefit over 20 years, right? If, if you have like a, a solar system, right? A Gen 24, 10 kilowatt, a Simo Gen 24, 10, 10 kilowatt, right? Over 20 years, let's look a bit uh, at the, the comparison there, right? So people like to compare that with trees. So this represents 600 trees that you planted, right? Over 20 years. If people don't really get trees, it represents 1.8 million kilometers of driving. Well, some people don't like driving. In terms of flights, it's, it represents 100 flights Vienna to New York, right? So as you can see, this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? We're looking at the inverter. And that's why in terms of the information, of course, if I go back to the start, right? What is the right information? We're a manufacturer, we're giving you the information. What is good is to check that this information, is it true or not, right? And that's where for us, we partnered up with uh, the Frau Institute where they did a lot of testing. So we have third party coming in and doing all the testing and we have a whole life cycle analysis report ready to go for you guys to analyze. As mentioned in Europe, it's becoming a big thing in terms of the product being manufactured, how it is manufactured and what happens to the end of life of the product, right? So this is in terms of the sustainability side of things and how sustainability is linked with the reliability part. The next part is the standards. What's one thing that we didn't uh, touch uh, a lot there? As you know, we have a solution team who looks after uh, the standard, all the requirements, and with everything that has changed in uh, December, I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys were aware. There was a lot of different requirement, a lot of uh, standard requirements that the inverter had to comply with. And of course, we were ready uh, on time. Just one thing which is very important is to do a USB update. So we thought that it would be also a good idea to show you guys um, also some of the steps in terms of the, uh, the update uh, with the inverter. So just in terms of the USB update with our snap inverter. So if you remove the bottom cover, you will see that there's a slot, a slot there. So make sure you have an eight gig gigabyte. This is the best usually eight gigabyte um, USB. Just plug that in with the software inside. If you need the link, we can send you all this information after the training. From there on the screen, you need to go to setup, then click on USB go to software update and you will see that it will tell you the old and the new, just press enter until everything is done. After running the update, this is important. You need to reload your country setup. So you press the third button, which is this one from the left five times. This will show up. Then from there you enter the code 73887 and you can select your different region there. And of course, those region, uh, the DNSP will let you know which one you need to set up on the inverter. When you press enter on your desired configuration, from there it will set up the country setup. If you want to check that it, it has the right thing, just go to info and device info and go to country setup and you will see one of those one there, right? It's very important that you do this all system um, after the, I think, 14 or 15 of December needs to have that uh, set up. So always good to check, make sure that your team has also the USB uh, with them. So that's pretty important there. So for today, that's pretty much uh, it. It's pretty a short uh, session that we have. The next one will be just a little bit uh, longest, will be an hour because there's quite a, a few topics to discuss. Um, so in the next webinar, you will get 10 CPD points. Uh, we will talk about the feature of the Gen24, 
how to use the battery simulation. We'll talk about energy management solution. We'll talk about backup solution. Uh, it's going to be a lot about the Gen24 itself, different setup that you can do. So please register for our next webinar if you haven't uh, done. So in the meantime, let's have a look if we have any question. All right, there is a question uh, from, uh, from Mark. It says, does the EPA of OCC have information regarding this? I think you're talking about the recycling side of things. Um, I think the CEC are working uh, on, on something uh, there. There's basically a group of, uh, which is like a working group with the government where they are talking about recycling of panels, for example, which also will tie it up with um, the inverters. But yeah, there's like a working group from what we've heard. Um, but yeah, that's what is on our side. All right, it doesn't look like there's any other question. Thanks again, guys, for joining the, the session today. Uh, as I mentioned, the next webinar, uh, which will be in two weeks, will cover basically the Gen24, all the options available uh, with the Gen24, different backups, so the PV point, the full backup, the battery combination with it, energy management solution, uh, battery simulation. So we'll do a whole, let's say, uh, battery package in, in a way and hybrid. Uh, package. So thanks so much everyone for joining us uh, today and I hope to see all of you guys soon. Thank you.